Section 17 of Astounding Stories 15, March 1931. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Alan Winteroud. Astounding Stories 15, March 1931, by Various. Terrors Unseen by Harl Vincent, Part A. Something about the lonely figure of the girl caused Edward Vale to bring his car to a sudden stop at the side of the road. When first he had glimpsed her off there on that narrow strip of rock-bound coast, he was mildly surprised, for it was a desolate spot and seldom frequented by bathers so late in the season. Now he was aroused to startled attention by the unnatural posture of the slender body that had just been erect and outlined sharply against the graying September sky. He switched off the ignition and sprang to the ground. Bent backward and twisted into the attitude of a contortionist, the little figure in the crimson bathing suit was a thing at which to marvel. No human being could maintain that position without falling, yet the girl did not fall to the jagged stones that lay beneath her. She was rigid, straining. Then suddenly her arm waved wildly and she screamed, a wild gasping cry that died in her throat on a note of despairing terror. It seemed that she struggled furiously with an unseen power for one horrible instant. Then the tortured body lurched violently and collapsed in a pitiful quivering heap among the stones. Eddie Vale was running now, miraculously picking his way over the treacherous footing. The girl had fainted, no doubt of that, and something was seriously wrong with her. A mysterious mechanical something whizzed by, something that buzzed like a thousand hornets and slithered over the rocks in a series of metallic clanks. Then it was gone, or so it seemed in the confusion of Eddie's mind, but he had seen nothing, probably a fantasy of his overworked brain, or only the surf breaking against the seawall. He turned his attention to the girl. She was moaning and tossing her head, returning painfully to consciousness. He straightened her limbs and placed his folded coat under the restless head, noting with alarm that vicious red welts marred the whiteness of her arms and shoulders. It was as if she had been beaten cruelly. Those marks could never have resulted from her fall. Poor kid! Subject to fits of some sort, he presumed. She was a good looker, too, and no mistake. He smoothed back the rumpled mass of golden hair and studied her features. They were vaguely familiar. Then she opened her eyes. Stark terror looked out from their ultramarine depths, and her lips quivered as if she were about to cry. He raised her to a more comfortable position and supported her with an encircling arm. She did cry a little, like a frightened child. Then, with startling abruptness, she sprang to her feet. Where is it? she demanded. Where's what? Eddie was on his feet, peering in all directions. He remembered the queer sounds he had heard or imagined. I don't know. The girl passed a trembling hand before her eyes, as if to wipe away some horrifying vision. Perhaps it's my imagination, but I felt it was just as real. One of father's iron monsters, beating me, bending me. I'd have snapped in a moment, but nothing was there. I I'm afraid. Eddie caught her as she swayed on her feet. There now, he said soothingly. You're all right, Miss Shelton. It's gone now, whatever it was. Iron monsters. In a flash it had come to him that this girl he held in his arms was Lena Shelton, daughter of the robot wizard. No wonder she was afflicted with hallucinations, but those bruises were real, as was the forcible twisting of her lithe young body. And he had heard something. You know me? The girl was calmer now and faced him with a surprised look. Yes, Miss Shelton. At least I recognize you from the pictures. Society page, you know. And I'm Edward Vale, Eddie for short on vacation and at your service. The girl smiled wanly. You know of father's break with Universal Electric, of his private experiments? I heard of the scrap and how he walked out on the outfit, but nothing further. Eddie thought grimly of how nearly he had come to losing his own job when David Shelton broke relations with his employers. He had been too enthusiastic in support of some of the older man's claims. It's been terrible, the girl whispered. She clung nervously to his arm as he picked the way back to the road. The loneliness and all. No servants will stay out here now, and Father spends all of his time in the laboratory. Then, 
this fear of the mechanical men, they haunt me. I guess they've got me a little goofy. Eddie laughed reassuringly. Perhaps, he suggested, you will let me help you. Your father, I believe, will remember me, and I'll be very glad to... No, no. The girl seemed frightened at the thought. I'm sure he wouldn't welcome you. He's changed greatly of late, and is suspicious of everyone, even keeping things from me. But it's awfully nice of you to offer your assistance, and you've been a perfect peach to take care of me this way. I... I better go now. They had reached the road, and Eddie looked uncertainly at his roadster. He hated to think of leaving the girl in this lonely spot. She was obviously in a state of extreme nervous tension, and to him seemed pathetically helpless and afraid. That the house? he asked, pointing in the direction of the gloomy old mansion, whose dilapidated gables were barely visible over the treetops. Yes. The girl shivered and drew closer to him. The ensuing silence was broken by the slam of a door. His car! Eddie looked toward it in amazement. He was hearing things again. The spring sagged on the driver's side, as under the weight of a very heavy occupant, but the seat was empty. Then came the whine of the starter, and the motor purred into life. The gears clashed sickeningly, and the car was jerked into the road with a violence that should have stripped the differential. He pulled the girl aside just as it roared past and disappeared around the bend in a cloud of dust. The sound of the exhaust died away rapidly and left them staring into each other's eyes in awed silence. David Shelton was prowling around in the shrubbery when they approached the house, a furtive, unkempt creature whom Eddie would hardly have recognized. He straightened up and peered at his daughter's companion with obvious disapproval. Lena, he said severely, I've told you we want no visitors. Yes, Dad, I know. But Mr. Vale's car was stolen out in front, and there is no way for him to go on. We must look after him. His car stolen? Who stole it? David Shelton drew close and glared suspiciously at his unwelcome visitor. One of your monsters, I think, she replied shakily, though we could see nothing. And the same thing attacked me and beat me. Look at my bruises. Shelton was examining the marks, and his fingers trembled as he touched his daughter's shoulder. He looked piteously into her eyes. Are you sure, Lena? Sure? Did you see it? No, no. But I felt and heard the iron arms and the clamps and the buzzing. Oh, it was horrible. The girl's voice rose hysterically. Oh, Lord, what have I done? groaned Shelton. It's true, then. Lena, listen, I succeeded in making them invisible, and one got away this morning. But I thought, I thought... He looked at Eddie, remembering his presence suddenly. But I'm talking too much. It seems to me I remember having seen you before, young man. You have, sir, Eddie stated, in the research library of Universal Electric. I work with Borden. They've sent you to find me? Shelton stiffened perceptibly. Indeed not. I'm on vacation and was merely passing by when I saw your daughter in danger, a danger I still do not understand. Yes, and he helped me to the road, Lena interposed, and then lost his car at the hands of... Silence! The father thundered, but his eyes fell before the fire that instantly flashed in those of the girl. Now you listen to me, she returned angrily. I stayed on here with you until I'm nearly crazy with your everlasting puttering and experimenting, hearing your uncanny machines walking around in the middle of the night, seeing impossible sights, then this thing I couldn't see but could feel, and you've gotten into such a state that you'll go crazy yourself if you continue. Something's got to be done, I tell you. I can't stand it. Her voice broke on a choked sob. But, Lena, don't but me, father. I mean it. Mr. Vale discovered your hideout quite by accident, and he's been very nice to me. I tell you he means no harm, and I want him to stay. If you're not decent to him, if you send him away, I swear I'll go too. I will, I will. Shelton's eyes misted, and something of the hardness left his expression. A look of haunting fear took its place, and he stared pleadingly at Eddie. Rrr, I'm cold, Lena exclaimed irrelevantly, and, and I believe I'm going to cry. She turned away and raced for the shelter of the gloomy old house without another word. Eddie turned inquiring eyes on his unwilling host. Just like her mother before her, Shelton muttered softly. Then he faced the younger man squarely, and his shoulders straightened. 
Mr. Vale, he said sheepishly, I've been a fool and I ask your pardon, but Lena doesn't know. There's something tremendous behind all this, something that's gotten beyond me. I'll send her away for her own safety, but I must stay on. If, if only there was someone I could trust. You can trust me, sir, Eddie said simply. The older man paced the ground nervously, and Eddie could see that he was under a most severe mental strain. Several times he halted in his tracks and peered anxiously at his guest. Then he seemed to make a sudden decision. Vale, he said sharply, I need help badly. I want you to stay if you will. You swear you'll not reveal what I am about to show you? I swear it, sir. You'll not report it to Universal? Never. They surveyed each other appraisingly. Eddie was mystified by the happenings of the day, and was curious to learn more concerning these mythical invisible creatures. It was inconceivable that the scientist had spoken truly of his accomplishment. Yet he had done some marvelous things with Universal, and maybe... Well, anyway, there was the girl. Come with me, Shelton was saying. I believe you're a square shooter, Vale. He was leading the way along the gravel path at the side of the house. Before them loomed the squat brick building that was the laboratory. The door crashed open before Shelton's hand had reached the knob, and one of those buzzing, unseen monstrosities rushed clanking by, knocking the scientist from his feet in its passage. Ponderous, speeding footsteps crunched the gravel of the path, and then with a wild thrashing of the underbrush alongside, the thing was gone. Eddie bent over the prostrate man, and saw that he was unconscious. A thin trickle of blood ran from a cut in the side of his head. Lena! Lena! called Eddie frantically. It was the first time in his life he was genuinely frightened. He half carried, half dragged the limp body through the door of the laboratory, and propped it in a chair. It required but a moment for him to see that Shelton's injury was inconsequential. He had only been stunned, and already showed signs of recovering. "'What is it, Mr. Vale? What's happened?' came the voice of Lena Shelton breathlessly. She was framed in the doorway, dressed now and panting from her exertions in responding to his call. "'Oh, it's father!' she wailed, dropping to her knees at his side. "'He's been hurt, badly, too.' "'No, not badly, Miss Shelton. He'll be around in a minute. I'm sorry to have excited you, but when I called I feared it was worse than it is.' He was washing the blood from her father's small wound as he spoke. She took the basin from his hand, spilling some of the water in her eagerness. Here, let me have that cloth, she demanded. Eddie admired her as her deft fingers took up the task. She was as exquisite in a simple sport outfit as she had been in her bathing suit. The scientist opened his eyes after a moment. Remembrance came at once, and he sat erect in the chair, staring. Lena, he exclaimed, grasping her hand conclusively. You're here, thank God. I dreamed, oh, it was horrible. I dreamed they had you. He clung to her closely. They? She murmured inquiringly. Yes, two of them are loose now. It's danger for you, my dear. You must leave at once. No, no, I can't let you out of my sight until they are captured or destroyed. He rose to his feet in his agitation and shook his head to clear it. He looked pleadingly at Eddie as if expecting him to offer a solution of the difficulty. Vale, he exploded, then pointing a shaking finger at an elaborate shortwave radio transmitter which occupied a corner of the large room. I ask you to bear witness. That is the source of energy for these creatures of mine, and it's shut down. How on earth can they keep going, I ask you? Perhaps someone else, sir, Eddie suggested doubtfully. Have you any enemies who might be able to duplicate the impulses of that apparatus? Bah! Enemies, yes, with Universal but none who could duplicate the complicated frequencies I use. My secrets are my own. I've never even put them on paper. Eddie was examining the intricate apparatus. You knew of the first one's escape, didn't you? He asked. How did it happen? Shelton again became the enthusiastic scientist. Here, he said. I'll show you and you can judge for yourself. He strode to the gleaming figure of a seven-foot robot of startlingly human-like appearance. Lena let forth an exclamation of repugnance and fear. No, Mr. Shelton, Eddie objected. The same thing will occur again. Then there will be three. We'll fix that, my boy. The scientist was removing cover plates from the hip joints of the mechanical man. I'll disconnect the cables that feed the locomotors. He can't walk then. Eddie was still doubtful, but dared offer no further objection, especially since Lena Shelton was watching in wide-eyed silence. 
he examined the monster and saw that it was quite similar in outside appearance to those supplied by Universal for heavy manual labor, excepting that this one was armed as were those used for prison guards. There was the same articulated limbs and the various clamps and hooks for lifting and heavy hauling, the tentacles for grasping, machine guns front and back. Under the helical headpiece that was the antenna, this robot seemed to have two eyes, a new feature. But closer examination showed these to be the twin lenses of a stereoscopic motion picture camera. This robot, then, could see, or at least it could record what the lenses saw for its masters. There, Sheldon grunted when he had finished his tinkering. He's paralyzed from the waist down. Let this one try and get away from us. Guns aren't loaded, are they? Eddie asked. Lord, no. Never have any of them loaded. That would be a fool stunt. Sheldon had pulled the starting handle of a motor generator, and its rising whine accompanied his words. The vacuum tubes of the transmitter glowed into life, and the scientist manipulated the controls rapidly. Lena was watching the robot with fascinated awe. Its arms moved in obedience to the controls, tentacles waved and coiled, the humming of its internal mechanisms filled the room. The locomotion controls had no effect, as the scientist had predicted. Eddie drew a sigh of relief. Now, Vale, watch, Shelton exulted. I'll show you what I was doing with the first one. He closed a switch that lighted another bank of vacuum tubes behind the control panel. You can make this one invisible? Eddie asked incredulously. Certainly, from the waist up. This ought to be good. Mind telling me the principle? Not at all. Now, I've your promise of secrecy. It's a simple matter, Vale, really. Just a problem of wave motions. Light, invisible light, the ultraviolet, you know. My robots are built of specially alloyed metals, which permit great freedom of molecular vibration. The insulating materials, and even the glass of the camera lenses, are possessed of the same property. Get it? I merely set up a wave motion in the atoms of the material that is in synchronism with the frequency of ultraviolet light, which is invisible to the human eye. All visible colors are absorbed, or more accurately, none are reflected, excepting the ultraviolet. Perfect transparency is obtained, since there is neither refraction nor diffraction of the visible colors. And there you are. Eddie stared at the upper half of the robot, and saw that it was changing color as Shelton tuned the transmitted wave. Then suddenly it was gone. The entire upper portion of the mechanism had vanished, had just snuffed out like the flame of a candle. He could see down into the tops of the thing's hollow legs. Shelton laughed at him as he stretched forth his hand and hesitantly felt for the invisible midsection and upper body. It was there, all right, unyielding and cold, that metal body but no trace of it was visible to the eye. He drew back his fingers as if they had touched a hot stove. The thing was positively uncanny. Dad, turn it off, please, Lena begged. It's getting on my nerves, please. Obligingly, Shelton pulled the switch. Now you'll see, he said to Eddie, whether the same thing happens. Watch. Mistily at first, the outlines of the monster's torso and arms came into view, semi-transparent, but clouding rapidly to opacity. Then it glinted with the barely visible violet, a solid once more, rigid and motionless. It was a lifeless mechanism, for the source of its energy had been cut off. Eddie had an almost irresistible impulse to pinch himself. Then he gasped audibly, as did Shelton, for the thing snuffed out of the sight again without warning, and the hum of its many motors resumed. There came a terrific clanking as it waved arms and tentacles and violently threshed with its upper body, but the visible portion, its legs, remained rooted to the floor of the laboratory. Lucky it was that the scientists had disconnected those wires. Lucky, too, that the machine guns were empty of ammunition. End of Terrors Unseen by Harl Vincent, Part A